Hello everyone, this is Dr. Vishal Devedi from Department of Biosciences and Bioengineering, IIT Guwahati. And what we were discussing, we were discussing about the different properties of the enzyme in the course Enzyme Science and Technology. And in the current module, we are discussing about the interaction of the substrate or the ligands with the enzyme. And in this context, what we have discussed, we have discussed about the how you can be able to uh, utilize the chromatography techniques to study the interaction between the substrate and the enzyme. And uh, in today's lecture, we are going to discuss some more techniques which are related to the in uh, studying the interaction between the uh, enzyme and the substrate. So as you can recall that uh, enzyme is actually recognizing the substrate utilizing the three important parameters. One is geometric uh, complementity, second is electronic complementity, and the third is the stereospecificity. What is mean by the geometric complementary is that the enzyme is going to recognize a typical three-dimensional conformation of the substrate. So if the substrate is acquiring that particular type of three-dimensional conformation, it will go and fit into the active site, right? And then once it gets fit into the active site, it is actually going to make the different types of interactions. And based on these interactions, the enzyme is going to further confirm that this is actually the cognate substrate it was looking for. And then ultimately, uh, the stereoscopy of the substrate is also important. For example, in most of the biological system, the L type of stereocity is more preferred over the T type of stereochemistry. So while the substrate is interacting with the enzyme, uh, it is actually making the lot of modifications. So when the enzyme is interacting with the substrate, okay, and it is making a complex like the ES complex, and uh, at this stage only, it, the enzyme is substrate is interact is. Uh, you know, making a lot of modifications into the uh, enzyme structures. It is, it is changing the, uh, you know, the mass or the size of the enzyme. Uh, it is also disturbing the electronic configuration of the groups what are present on the enzyme. So that can be mapped in the spectroscopic uh, technique. And uh, then it can also be able to utilize that for studying the some of the uh, other techniques like uh, the uh, there will be a change in internal in internal in heat of the enzyme substrate system and that can be measured in the system called itc and uh, we have discussed many of these uh, studies uh, many of these techniques which can be used when you are mapping the enzyme substrate complex formations like for example it is actually going to study, it is going to change the size, size in terms of molecular weight and that can be mapped in the electrophoresis. And then it can also be able to change the hydrodynamic surface area and that can be mapped in the chromatography. And uh, then it also can change the surface chemistry and that can also be mapped in the ion exchange, HIC or the uh, surface plasma resonance. And then it can also be able to interfere or it actually can alter the different types of uh, energy parameters and that can also be able to map into the isothermal titration colorimetry. And then ultimately it also going to change the electronic configuration of the different groups onto the enzyme or the substrate and then that can be mapped into the spectroscopy. So let's first start discussing about the uh, electrophoresis uh, uh, methods. And uh, in the previous lecture, if you recall, we could we have discussed about the ion exchange chromatography and as well as the gel filtration chromatography to uh, utilize or to see the power of the chromatography system. So let's discuss about the electrophoresis, how you can be able to use the electrophoresis to measure the size of the object. So in the electrophoresis, uh, electrophoretic system, you have two options. One is called as the native page. And so page can be of two types. It can be of native page. It could be SDS page. And uh, it could also be a variation of the native page where you can have the urea page. Okay. 
and uh, all of these three are can very very in, uh, you know easily be used to measure the mass of the enzyme okay depending on the what kind of structure or what kind of uh, in, you know the uh, substrate is so if the enzyme is interacting with a substrate and if this substrate is also a protein then that is actually going to form the enzyme substrate complex and uh, majority of these enzyme substrate complex formations are reversible in nature that means the enzyme and substrates are not covalently bound to each other right so in that cases uh, when you run the sds page the enzyme substrate complex when you run the sds page it is actually going to be broken down because the sds is actually going to denature the three dimensional structure of the enzyme and as a result it is actually going to break the enzyme substrate complex so sds page is not useful when you have the enzyme substrate complex and it is uh, not very robust uh, then you what you have two options one is you can run the native page and you can run the urea page so we'll discuss both of these so that you will understand how you can be able to use that so native page means the polyacrylamide gel electrophoresis minus beta mercaptoethanol ethanol and minus fds if you want to know more about the uh, page and how you can be able to run the page for uh, determining the or how what are different components of the page operators and all that thing you can actually be able to follow some of my uh, lectures from the other courses like the experimental biotechnology course and that actually there where i have discussed in detail about the native page or the urea page so we are not going to discuss that whatever i am going to discuss is that you native page will actually going to be devoid of beta mercaptoethanol ethanol and devoid of the sds page which means it is actually not going to affect the enzyme substrate complexes and how uh, and if the substrate is proteinaceous in nature for example if the substrate is 10 kda and the enzyme is uh, 50 kda then the enzyme substrate complex is going to be 60 kda right so that is a very significant change in the uh, in the size of the enzyme and that's how you can be able to measure that so in a native page what you're going to do is you're going to run this under the two different conditions so in the lane one you are going to and in lane two right so in lane one you are not going to make any kind of modifications and so you're going to have the enzyme plus substrate complex which you are going to run into the lane one so it's imagine that you are going to get a band here right now in the lane two what you are going to do is you are actually going to make a change right so what you're going to do is in this one you are going to run enzyme plus substrate but you are actually going to add suppose 100 millimolar of nacl or you can actually be able to use the a urea okay so nacl is because mostly the substrate is always interacting with the enzyme with the electrostatic interactions so if you add the nacl it is actually going to result into the breakdown so this is actually a 60 kda band okay and you can actually be able to know the size of these bands if you run a molecular weight marker so if you run the molecular weight marker um, and if you don't know about molecular weight marker molecular weight markers are actually the standard proteins of the defined size okay so it actually going to tell you which uh, protein band is corresponding to uh, which molecular weight okay so this is 60 kda now when you run this in the uh, in the 100 millimolar nacl and urea what will happen is that you are actually going to see the two bands you are going to see one band which is corresponding to the enzyme so this is actually the enzyme so it's a 50 kda band and then you are going to see another band which is actually the 10 kda band and that is for the substrate so this is actually for the protein this is for the substrate and that's how you can be able to say that the enzyme and substrate were interacting with each other uh, and you have already verified right because you it was showing a 60 kda band and it's actually showing the 50 kda band if you want you can actually run the in the lane 3 you can just run the enzyme itself and that actually is going to be uh, you know going to run in front of the 
uh, this lane number two. Okay, so that will confirm that this is actually the enzyme band, not the other any other kind of modifications. In the urea page, what you can do is you can actually be able to run the urea page either in a vertical gradient or uh, in a in a horizontal gradient. So you can actually be able to run the a gradient urea page and the gradient urea page what it is actually going to do is what you're going to do is you're going to vary the urea concentration from zero to eight molar in this direction okay so this lane is zero so what you're going to do is you're going to make the enzyme substrate complex right and then you are going to load that into the different lanes okay so you're going to suppose you are going to have a lanes so this is one molar, two molar, three molar, four molar, five molar, six, seven, eight, like that. Okay. So what will happen is that the first the enzyme is going to be like this. So this is going to be enzyme substrate complex. And as you go towards the end of the urea, right? What will happen is that you are going to start seeing, uh, you know, the intensity of this band will small, and then you will start seeing another band. Okay. And then you will see that this is actually decreasing. And this is increasing because more and more substrate is coming out from the protein. And that's how it is actually going to be uh, coming in this space. And ultimately, what you're going to see is you're going to see that this particular band is actually going to disappear. And a new band is appearing because this is the new band for the enzyme alone. And you are going to see a very high quantity of substrate. So this is the place where actually the enzyme plus substrate is broken down, right? And uh, by the help of the urea page, you can be able to determine whether the uh, how, whether the enzyme substrate complex is formed or uh, how stable the interaction is, right? So SDS page is a very very robust technique uh, to answer the question whether the substrate is interacting with the enzyme or not, considering that the substrate is proteinaceous in nature. If the substrate molecular weight is very low, for example, you are talking about like glucose and hexose uh, uh, and hexokinase, then in those cases, it is probably not be the best technique to answer the questions. Uh, so uh, this is all about the electrophoretic uh, methods. So you can actually be able to run the page in the native page, SDS page, and answer as the urea page to answer the question whether the particular proteinaceous substrate is interacting with the protein or not and whether the how stable the complex is. So we have discussed about the electrophoresis, we have discussed about the chromatography uh, methods and now let's move on to the next method and the next method is the spectroscopic method. So in the spectroscopy, if spectroscopic method, you are actually going to utilize the different types of spectroscopy uh, techniques, so different spectroscopy techniques. And uh, as the name suggests, right, uh, spectroscopy means you are actually going to see alteration in the, in the spectra, right, of the enzyme or substrate, right. And the alteration in the substrate of the uh, or spectra of an enzyme can be possible by many ways. One of the classical way in which you can be able to map that is actually going to change the electronic configuration of uh, of the key residues or key. Okay, so electronic configuration is mostly being responsible. So what will happen is that suppose you have an enzyme, right? And it has a arginine group, right? It has an arginine amino acid at the active side or suppose it has a serine at the active side and so on. So serine is actually containing the hydroxyl group, which actually contains the lone pair of electron, whereas arginine also contains the amino group and that also contains the lone pair of electron. And these lone pairs of electron sometimes get this delocalized or get interacted with the substrate and that's how they are actually going to show you a change in the, uh, in the spectra, right? And 
so that is going to be mapped in the different types of chromatography technique apart from the electrons in the valence shell electron or the outer shell electrons you can also be able to map these kind of interaction with the different types of spectroscopy technique so when we talk about the spectroscopy technique it can actually be able to work on the different types of uh, molecular uh, processes for example, you can have the electronic transitions, you can have the rotations, you can have the vibrations and you can have the nuclear transitions. In the electronic transitions, you can be able to map that under the spectroscopy, UV visible spectroscopy technique. Rotations and the vibration can be mapped under the IR spectroscopy and the nuclear transitions can be mapped under the NMR spectroscopy. So, uh, uh, basically, the most of these spectroscopy techniques can be exploited for studying the enzyme substrate interactions, but the electronic transitions are very, very sensitive compared to the nuclear transitions and electronic transitions are easy to map because that can be done in the very easy technique called as a UV visible spectroscopy. So, UV visible spectroscopy, as the name suggests, it is actually going to be a technique where you are actually going to see the UV, the range in the UV visible uh, spectra, right, of a compound or of an enzyme, and you will see how it is actually going to alter. So, what is mean by the UV visible spectroscopy? So, UV visible spectroscopy is a, is a spectroscopy technique which where you are actually going to work under the visible range which, where, which starts from the uh, UV range and it goes up to the visible range. So, UV range starts from the 10 nanometer to 400 nanometer and within the UV range you have the newer UV range and as well as the far UV range. So, near UV range starts from the 250 nanometer to 400 nanometer whereas the far UV range starts from the 190 to 250 nanometer and you also have the vacuum UV range which is actually less than the 190 nanometer and that is actually going to be useless for any kind of molecular interaction studies. And then we also have the visible range so it can be from the 400 nanometer to 780 nanometer. So starting from the 250, uh, 190 nanometer starting from the so UV visible range is starting from the 190 to 780 nanometer whereas in which the 190 to 250 is the UV, uh, UV range and from 250 to uh, or 400 to 780 is the visible range. So the absorption of the UV and the visible range is through the transition of an electron in the molecule from lower to a high energy or molecular orbital. Right? So this is what it has been shown how the different types of UV visible spectroscopy uh, happens. Right, So the absorption of UV and the visible light is through the transition of an electron in the molecule from the lower to a high energy state. So when you are exciting a, a molecule, right? so when you are exciting a group what is present inside the enzyme, the electrons of this particular functional group goes from the lower energy state to the higher energy state and then there will be a sigma to sigma pi transition is a very high energy process and therefore lies in the vacuum UV range whereas the alkanes uh, whereas only the sigma to sigma pi transition is possible to show the absorption band around 150 nanometer. Alkenes have the pi to pi star orbitals and can show the several transitions. The lowest energy state is the pi to pi star giving a absorption band around 170 to 190 nanometer for a non-conjugated alkenes. The presence of the non-burning electron in a molecule is in, is in an alpha ketone for example the absorption band is 150 nanometer arise due to the pi to pi transition in the carbonyl bonds. So when you want to perform the UV visible spectroscopy you are actually going to use a a spectrophotometer right which is actually going to measure the uv visible spectroscopy you is you going to measure the uv visible spectroscopy and it actually going to give you the spectra right so spectrophotometer can be of two types it can be of single beam spectrophotometer or it could be a double beam spectrophotometer so in a single beam spectrophotometer you are actually going to have the 
uh, one light so it's going to have the light source so for example in a uv range or the visible range so it's going to have two bulbs one for the visible range one another for for the uv lamp and then both of these lamps are actually going to have the mirror right so this mirror is going to reflect these lights and then they will go to the monochromator the monochromator is actually a kind of a filter and that is actually going to filter the desirable wavelength so it's actually going to give you the desirable wavelength for example if i have selected the particular lambda then it is actually going to screen out all other molecules all other wavelengths but it's only going to give allow the passage of the lambda so monochromator could be of different types it could be a diffraction rating it could be prism it could be anything and then it actually going to just, you know interact with the reference cells so in a in a in a single beam in a, in a spectrophotometer you are going to have only one slot to keep the qubit okay and then it is actually going to allow the absorbance of the light right and then the unabsorbed light that is the i0 is actually going to uh, reach to the detector okay as a parallel beam okay so when the beam comes out it actually going to split into two part okay one part will go and in, uh, can be received by the detector without any absorbance and the other one is actually going to go through the sample and you can actually be easily be able to calculate what is the value of i0 by i and that's how it is actually going to give you the value of absorbance because this is the 100% right this is the 100% light and this is the probably 20% or 30% whatever depending on how much is light been absorbed right so i0 by i is actually going to give you the absorbance of that particular sample so the light enters the instrument through an entrance slit and it is collimated and focused on to the dispersing element typically a diffraction getting the light of desired wavelength is selected simply by rotating the monochromator and impinged on to the sample the intensity of the radiation transmitted to the sample is measured and converted to the absorbance or the transmitters then we have the double beam spectrophotometer so in a double beam spectrophotometer uh so remember that in a single beam spectrophotometer you only have one beam okay that one beam you are splitting into two and in this one that is all mathematically or you know virtually you are doing right so the second beam is directly going into the detector and it's showing that this is the 100% light right and this is the uh, you know the absorbed light okay so based on that you can be able to calculate the absorbance and the transmittance but if there will be any fluctuation in the direct light that you will not be able to uh, map or measure so that is the one of the drawback of working with the uh, single beam spectrophotometer and that's why you should have the double beam spectrophotometer so in a double beam spectrophotometer uh, has two light beams okay one of which passes through the sample while the other passes through a reference cell this allows the more reproducible measurement as in fluctuation in the light source or the instrument electronics appear in the both reference and the sample and thereby can easily be removed from the sample spectrum by subtracting the reference spectrum the most commonly used detector in the uv spectro are photomultipliers or the pmds the monochromators in these spectrophotom is placed after the sample so that the sample is exposed to the entire spectrum of the incident radiation and the transmitted radiation is dispersed into its component so it's exactly the same way that you have a light uv source you have a light source then it is actually going to you know fall onto a mirror and then this mirror is actually going to reflect so depending on the and then there will be a monochromator this monochromator could be a diffraction rating or the prism and uh, from the diffraction rating you are going to have the single beam wavelength right and uh, then it is actually going to have the you know reflectors right and it is actually going to split into uh, into two beams one will go like this the other one is going to the straight so one will go into the reference cell reference cell or it is also been called as blank whereas the other beam is actually going into the sample cell okay and then both of these are actually going to be collected back and that's how you are actually going to detect the intensity of the beam that comes from the reference cell 
and the intensity of the beam what comes from the uh, sample cell and that's why if there will be any fluctuation in the intensity of these bulbs for example if there will be any reflection in the intensity of these bulbs it will reflect into the decrease in intensity of this beam and ultimately it is also going to reflect into the intensity of the both of these beam sources because the all the both of these beam sources are coming from the single beam right so it and if there will be any fluctuation or any kind of modulation into the sample or the reference uh, cell right that also can be mapped so that's why the errors are going to be reduced when you are going to talk when you are going to use the double beam spectrophotometers now when we are going to have the uh, sample into the qubit it is actually going to absorb the material and that's how it is actually going to follow the beers lambda law so it is quite intuitive that the higher concentration of a absorbing species in a sample would lead to the higher absorption of the light furthermore the higher thickness of the sample should result in the higher absorption and that's why the absorbance is directly proportional to the concentration and absorbance is directly proportional to the length and that's why absorbance is going to be called as absorbance is epsilon uh, cl and that's why epsilon is the molar absorptivity so the equality sh showing linear relationship between the absorbance and the concentration of the absorbing molecule and that is known as the beer lambert law or the beers law transmittency is another way of describing the absorption of light Trans transmittency is simply the ratio of intensity of radiation transmitted to the sample to the incident radiation it is clear from the def definition of the absorbance and transmittance that both are dimensionless quantities okay so absorbance and transmittance are both represented in a arbitrary unit or au unit okay so what will happen is that if you are in illuminating a sample with the i0 intensity and suppose this is the sur total surface area of the absorbing unit which has the the thickness of dx and it has a, a surface area of epsilon uh, then it is actually going to absorb the material according to this area and volume okay and uh, the path length is l then the number of molecules per centimeter is going to be given by the molecules by the uh, centimeter cube and that number of molecule is actually going to decide how what how much the sample is going to absorb or how much less it is actually going to transmit now take the simple examples right so an absorption spectra of n style tryptophanamine so what you see here is the wavelength versus the absorbance right and the quantity of interest in a absorption spectra is the molar absorption coefficient epsilon which varies from the wavelength okay so the wavelength at which the highest uh, molar absorption coefficient is called as the epsilon maxima is observed in a representation as uh, represented as lambda max the area of cross section of the absorbing species put an upper limit to the molar absorption coefficients then uh, the uv spectroscopy can be used for mapping the different types of biological molecules because most of the biological molecules are having the chromophores for example in the amino acids and the proteins so among the 20 amino acid that constitute the protein the tryptophan tyrosine and phenylalanine absorb in the uv range whereas all the three amino acids show the structure absorbance spectra the absorbance by the phenylalanine is weak with an epsilon maxima of 200 uh, per mole per centimeter at 250 nanometer whereas the molar absorption coefficient of 1400 is at 274 nanometer and 570 at uh, 280 nanometer are observed for tyrosine and tryptophan respectively disulfide linkages formed through the oxidation of cysteine residue also contribute to the absorption of protein in the near uv range okay and the absorption spectra of protein are thereby largely dominated by the tryptophan and as well as the tyrosine in the near uv range and in the far uv range the peptide bond emerges as the most important chromophore in the protein side chain of the aspartate glutamate asparagine glutamine arginine histidine are also absorbing 
uh, in the far UV range. So what you will see here is that this is an absorption spectra of a protein and it actually shows a very intense peak at 280 nanometer, okay? And this 280 nanometer is a submission of the different types of chromosomes are present in this, mostly the tryptophan, which is actually going to absorb at 280 nanometer. And tryptophan and tyrosine are actually the predominant chromophore what are present in the uh, protein molecules. Apart from that, you can also have the uh, chromophore in the nucleic acids. You can also have the chromophore in the other biological molecules like the nucleotides. And you can have the porphyrins such as heme, chlorophylls and other plant pigments. Then we have a retinol, which is a light sensitive molecule, vitamins and variety of unsaturated comp compound which are having the chromophore in the UV and visible range. And technically, the UV visible spectroscopy can be done in two modes. One is called as the absorption mode and the other is called as the uh, emission mode. Okay, So other is called as the uh, different spectroscopy. So in the absorption mode, what you are going to do is you are going to study the absorption of the particular wavelength. Okay particular wavelength light source. It can be in the UV range or it can be in the visible range, which means it can be in the UV range. So, uh, and as I said, you know, the absorption spectroscopy comes because it is actually going to be work on the electronic configuration of the molecule, right? So if the electronic configuration is getting disturbed, okay, or if there will be any perturbation into the electronic configuration, it is actually going to change how easily or how difficult an electron has is actually going to receive the energy from the system and then it will actually go on to the high energy state and from there it actually comes back, right? And that is actually going to be variable from the uh, one wavelength to another wavelength, right? because most of these electrons are under the you know when they are rotating or when they are moving into their uh, into the shell they are associated with a specific amount of energy so when you are actually illuminating the object uh, that it actually going to you know there will be a resonance between the uh, between the energy of that particular electron and the energy what you are supplying from outside. So if there will be a resonance between these two, then it is actually going to absorb maximally and that's how it is actually going to give you a, a specific and characteristic wavelength, a characteristic absorption spectra. Let's see some of the examples. So let's see how that functional group is actually going to decide how the absorption is going to work. So, for example, I have taken three molecules. One is benzene. Another one is that I have added the OH onto the benzene. And then third one is the paranitrophenol. So, I have added the NO2 on the front. So, this one has no functional group. This one has one functional group. And this one has the two functional group. And let's see. So, this is the benzene. So, this is the benzene spectra, right? So, this actually goes like this, right? and it goes and give you a wavelength of 250 nanometer. So at 250 nanometer, it's actually going to absorb maximally because at that particular wavelength, the electrons are receiving the maximum amount of energy and that's how they are going into the high energy state. And then when you added the OH, right, you are actually shifting the wavelength and that's how it is actually absorbing like this. It is actually going to absorb slightly more right so it's actually absorbing at 270 nanometer and then when you are putting the no2 and oh it is further shifted right it's further shifted towards this side and that's how it is actually because you see now you have added the functional group and these functional groups are interacting with the solvent molecules and uh, because of these interactions the electronic configuration or the electrons which are freely been available are you know which actually can go uh, into the higher energy state is restricted because they are actually interacting with the solvent molecule and that's why these electrons are not free for the 
moving moving into the high energy state and that actually goes up and that's why you are actually going to require higher energy wavelength and that's how it is actually going to give you the uh, you know the lambda max at a slightly more on more wavelength then you can see the another system we have the conjugated double bond system and absorption peaks so in this case i have taken a three example one is benzene which is absorbing at 255 nanometer then we have naphthalene so here you have one benzene ring you have two benzene ring here you have three benzene ring right so it is absorbing at 286 nanometer and this one is absorbing at 375 nanometer so what you see here is that this is the benzene spectra right and benzene is absorbing at 255 nanometer and then when you are putting two benzene ring it is shifting towards this side and that's how it is actually absorbing at uh, so this is the naphthalene, it is absorbing at 286 nanometer and then you also have the anthracene which is actually three benzene rings so that's actually absorbing at even more on this side and that's how it is absorbing at 375 nanometer. Uh, so uh, absorption spectra is very sensitive for two things. One, it is actually very sensitive for the solvent molecules and it also very sensitive for the neighboring molecules okay so it which means you can be able to use the absorption spectra to measure or to see how it is actually going to affect the enzyme structure so if you take the uh, basal level of enzyme structure or basal level of enzyme uh, absorption spectra it will actually going to show you one spectra and then when you add the substrate and if the substrate is actually going to interfere into the electronic configuration of the some of the key residues or some of the key molecules or if it is actually going to experience any kind of alteration in the solvent content then it is actually going to show you the deviation in the absorption spectra. Let's take an example of this. So we have taken this examples and this I have taken from one of the paper, okay, from JBC, right. So what you see here is that here I have taken a protein, okay, uh, which is uh, called uh, HPO, right, so it's called hemoparacidase. And then what you, and this is actually a protein which contains the heme as the functional group or heme as a cofactor. So what you see here is that this is actually the native enzyme. So when you have the native enzyme, it is actually going to show you uh, uh, absorbance at 400 nanometer, right? And when you add the H2O2, okay, so H2O2 will go and bind to this particular enzyme in basically it binds next to the heme more residues and that's how you will see that there will be a shift in the absorption peak so it's actually shifts now at 411 nanometer okay and when it is shifting and then you are adding the different types of substrate or different types of inhibitors so for example in this case i have added the inhibitor like uh, clochimazole and what happened is that as soon as it shifts you add the clotrimazole and then clotrimazole actually goes and bind and that's how it is now reducing the absorbance. This means clotrimazole, basically this one is shifting the peak, right? So it is shifting the peak. This means it is actually changing the electronic configuration of some of the key residues, right? And that's how it is actually shifting the peak. Whereas the clotrimazole is not shifting the peak, it is reducing the intensity. Right, so it is reducing the intensity, right? So it actually goes down like this, right? This means it is actually masking the sample or masking the light, okay? This means it is actually not allowing the molecule to absorb the light very strongly. This means it is actually protecting the system, okay? And this is actually being done always by the solvent molecules, okay? So because the inhibitor is in the vicinity of the enzyme, it is actually behaving just like a solvent and it is not allowing the enzyme to absorb or enzyme the functional groups uh, present at the active site to absorb because it is, you know, having the kind of a curtain outside. This is the same data what I have shown where I have removed the hydrogen peroxide. So when you don't have a hydrogen peroxide, this kind of binding is going to be compromised.
Now, what is the major uh, issue with the absorption spectroscopy is that it is actually going to show you a uh, alteration and it is actually going to show you uh, alteration because of the interaction of the substrate. But the absorption spectroscopy is very, very insensitive uh, compared to their different spectroscopies. Okay? And that's why mostly people are not using the absorption spectroscopy for studying the interaction of the uh, substrate with the protein, uh, enzyme molecules. Mostly people are using the different spectroscopy. So what is mean by the different spectroscopy? Different spectroscopy means that you are looking for a difference, right? So you are looking for the difference or you are going to say that the change in the spectra due to substrate molecule, right? And uh, so, for example, if I have a protein, okay, and for example, HPO, right? We have taken an example, right? And it absorbs at 400 nanometer, right? Now, if I add a substrate, for example, if I add the H2O2, right? What will happen is that H2O2 is going to take up some of the intensity from hydrogen peroxide uh, from the protein, right? And that's why it is actually going to absorb at 400 nanometer eleven, right? So now the energy what is going into the protein will actually go into the complex, and as a result, it is actually going to show you a difference in the spectra. And uh, if you understand this uh, more uh, in a geometric way, so imagine that this is a protein, right? And this is the portion of the protein which is responsible for binding of the substrate, right? Now, if I fill this space, okay, if I suppose I fill this space with a uh, yellow dye, okay? So, this, you can imagine that this is the area which is actually being responsible for the uh, uh, giving you the absorption spectra. So what will happen is that it is actually going to show you an absorption spectra like this. And because of this, it is actually having the absorption spectra, right? Now, if I have added the hydrogen peroxide, right? So what will happen is that at low concentration of hydrogen peroxide, for example, if I add like uh, uh, one, one millimolar, for example, if I add one millimolar, it actually going to give you some amount of molecules. So hydrogen peroxide molecules will go and will bind, right? So suppose they have captured this much area, right? So if they have captured this much area of the active site, this means they have reduces the area of the protein to be absorbed under this, right? So as a result, what will happen is that it is actually going to show you a change in absorption. Now this change, what you see here is actually, this is I'm showing in absorption spectra, right? This is absorption spectra, but this change is very subtle, okay? This change is very little to be mapped in the absorption spectra. Instead, if you do the different spectroscopy, so what you can do is you can just make this protein spectra as the zero spectra. So in that case, what I'll do is I'll take the protein spectra so, uh, I will. what I'll do is I'll take the protein spectra, right? So, I'll make the protein spectra as absorption 0, okay? So, what will happen is that this is 0, right? So, protein will show me an absorption like this, okay? Now, if I add the hydrogen peroxide, okay? So, what will happen is that it is actually going to withdraw some of the substrate, right? Some of the these molecules, right? So it is actually going to go like this. So this much is now been amplified, okay? Because it is showing the more into the dip, okay? And this is side. This side is minus side. This side is the positive side. So this is the positive uh, signal. This is a negative signal, okay? Now if I add some more, like for example, if I make it five millimolar, right? Then it will go further down. How long it will go? Because it is actually going to now capture some more amount of active site. So if I do third time, it is going to capture more. So it's going to go like this. It's going to keep capturing until this whole 
chromophoric site is going to be captured. So, for example, if I do another injection, another range like 8 millimolar, 10 millimolar, 20 millimolar, like that. Okay, so it will be keep going, keep going like this, and ultimately it is actually going to get saturated and it will going to stop going. Right, and that is very very interesting because once you go beyond this, for example, if you add 50 millimolar, okay, so 50 millimolar will actually go will and show you a separate molecule so, okay and in that case you will see a absorbance of the hydrogen peroxide so this is a hydrogen peroxide molecules uh, absorbance whereas this is the withdrawal or this is the subtraction of the absorbance because of the hydrogen peroxide binding into the enzyme so once the value will go beyond this binding site it will actually go and be present as a separate molecule. So, this is actually going to be present as separate molecule and that is why it is actually going, instead of showing you uh, different spectroscopy, it will actually going to sh start showing you absorption spectroscopy. So, this is actually unbound hydrogen peroxide, whereas this is a bound hydrogen peroxide and that is very, very robust and important tool to be exploited in the different spectroscopy. So, the selectivity and the accuracy of spectrophotometric analysis of sample containing absorbing interference may be markedly improved by the technique of different spectroscopy. The measured value is the difference absorbance between the two equimolar solution of the analyte in different chemical forms which exhibit the spectra characteristic. Reproducible changes may be induced into the spectra of analyte by the addition of one or more reagents. The absorbance of the interfering substance is not altered by the reagents. Uh, what are the different advantages? The advantage is that it is selective and accurate. It is having the less impact of the interfering agents and it also have a simple and this is a, one of the very cheap and reliable uh, label free technique to study the enzyme substrate interactions. The only condition is that this substrate will go and interact with the enzyme and the enzyme should actually if it is it is always been easy if the enzyme has some chromophore which means if it has some uh, you know colored uh, cofactor present for example FAD or heme then it is easy because then you can actually be able to monitor this. How we are going to do this? We are what we are going to do is we are going to take a double beam spectrophotometer right and in the double beam spectrophotometer you are going to prepare the sample right so in a double beam spectrophotometer you are going to have two spec uh, qubits right so this is going to be a reference qubit this is going to be a sample qubit now both are actually going to have the 1 ml of your protein sample okay so 1 ml of protein sample of same amount okay so for example you fill the both the qubits with 1 ml of enzyme solution, 1 ml of enzyme, okay. Now, in the reference qubit, you are going to add, for example, 5 microliter of buffer, okay. And in the sample qubit, you are actually going to add the 5 microliter of your substrate. For example, in this case, we are doing it with the H2O2, okay. So, what will happen is, that, and then when you are actually being done with the 1 ml of enzyme, what you are going to do is, you are going to collect one spectra, okay. So, it is actually going to show you a single line, okay, because the, the value, because the sample and as well as the reference qubits are actually going to have the same amount of proteins, right. So, it is actually going to show you a straight line with a zero absorbance, okay. Now, when you add the 5 microliter of buffer into the reference qubit and 5 microliter of substrate into the sample qubit, it will, if the substrate is interacting with the enzyme, it will actually going to show you a dip. If the substrate is interacting, so if the substrate is interacting, it is actually going to, you know, mask some of the chromophores and that is why it is actually going to show you the uh, dip in the spectra. 
if the substrate is not interacting then it is actually going to show you a an increase in spectra right so this is actually going to be when the substrate is not interacting So this you have to continue after 5 microliter you can add 10 microliter so here also you have to add 10 microliter the only condition is that your dilution should not go beyond 1% okay so this means you can actually be able to don't do like a lot of dilution otherwise you will see this deep and your baseline is also going to do right so this is actually called as baseline okay the zero doubles and then when you keep increasing it is actually keep going like this Right, and it will keep going like this and ultimately it is actually going to stop okay so then you what you are going to do is you are going to show this is the initial and this is the final right so this is the final spectra this is the initial spectra and what you are going to do is you are going to start calculating the delta absorbance right how much absorbance it is lost right and at what concentrations so you are going to have the substrate concentration and you are going to have the delta absorbance okay and then what you are going to do is you are going to calculate 1 upon delta absorbance and 1 upon substrate okay and that is what you are going to do in the next step so once you collected this data the data will look like something like this okay so this is actually going to be a baseline so this is the baseline and and this is actually the final data, this is the final curve, and this is your initial curve, okay? And from each curve, you can be able to calculate the delta A, which means how much is the deep of the absorbance, and then you can calculate the one by delta A, and similarly, you can add the substrate concentration, so you can calculate the substrate concentration, and you can calculate the one by substrate concentration. And then you can just make a plot between 1 by delta A and 1 by delta S, okay? And that is actually going to give you a linear curve, okay? And then taking this into account, you can be able to use this formula, okay? And you can be able to calculate the KD, which means you can actually be able to calculate the dissociation constant, okay? Because after this, if you, if sub, for example, you see the, all the substrate, all the spectra are coming here. If you add more, it will actually going to show you more. Okay, and uh, this is what we are going to show you. This is another data, right? So this is the H2O2 binding of the, the protein into the hemoprotein. Okay, so this is the data what you are going to see when you are going to do the H2O2 binding to a, a real protein. So these are the real samples. So we have uh, prepared a small demo clip just to explain you each and every of these steps, how you can be able to perform the different spectroscopy and how that can be, how you can do the calculations and other things. And I hope that this demo clip will actually help you to uh, perform these experiments in your laboratory. Hello everyone, I am Alok Kumar Pandey, a PhD scholar and under Professor Vishal Trivedi in Department of Bioscience and Bioengineering, IIT Gauti. In this video, I will be performing a demo on the optical difference spectroscopy experiment. So for this experiment, we have taken a protein and ligand as example and we will use this experiment to find out the KD value of this ligand binding to the protein. So when a ligand binds to the protein, it creates a difference in the characteristics absorbance of that protein and that difference we will exploit using a formula to calculate the KD value of this ligand binding to this protein. So for this experiment, the materials which we required are, require are a protein solution and a ligand solution of known concentrations in the same buffer, the buffer and two quartz covets and a double ring spectrophotometer. So now we will start the experiment. These are the two covets, both contain the protein solutions. Now we will put them in the spectrophotometer. So uh, one covet will put in the a sample cell and the other one we will put in the reference cell and after this we will scan this to get a baseline so here we will click on measure to find out the baseline and this sample is a blank sample so we can name it as blank and now it is taking the baseline 
nothing is visible because it is just a blank sample so it will not show any line but after we obtain the baseline we will add our uh, ligand to to the protein in the sample cell and we will uh, observe any dip in the peak at around 400 nanometer which is characteristics for this protein and consequently we will add increasing concentrations of the ligand the ligand so this is the ligand solution we will take 2.5 microliter for, from this and then we will add this 2.5 microliter in the sample covet and the same amount of buffer we will add in the reference covet to neutralize the dilution caused by adding that ligand so same amount of buffer we will add in the reference cell and after adding this again we will scan this so now after adding the ligand we will measure its spectrum we can name this as c1 concentration 1 and this is the spectrum it is given for the uh, for this concentration of ligand so we will we are expecting a dip in the peak but the concentration is less so we will get a less dip or we may not absorb in in the smaller concentrations then we will add further increasing concentrations of the ligand so here we can see around 400 we are not getting any significant dip in the peak so we will add another concentrations in the same way as i have shown and we will so now i have added the ligand 2.5 microliter of the ligand more and we will take the spectrum with the next concentration as as c2 we will label this concentration as C2 and this is the spectrum uh, for the for this concentration of the ligand again same we will be expecting a peak at around 400 see see this at this concentration we got a nice dip in the peak at around 400 nanometer so now we, we can see we will uh, use few more concentrations of the ligand and watch the spectrum and dip in the peak so now we will take the spectrum for next concentration uh, we will label this concentration at c3 and measure the spectrum uh, again we will we, we will see the a dip in the peak which would be uh, more than it was on the previous concentrations and similarly we will keep increasing the concentration of the ligand until we we see that there is not a significant difference between the dips of the peak and then after that we will use this difference in the absorbance to calculate the uh, kd value of this ligand binding to to uh, this protein so now we will come to the calculation part of the experiment this is the data which we have obtained from the inst instrument and these are the absorbance values at different ligand concentrations the ligand concentrations are calculated uh, using the volume of the ligand which was added from the stock solution of the ligand and on the x-axis these are the wavelengths at which we took the spectrum so a graph we can plot a graph between wavelength and absorbance here we can see in the graph that at the first ligand concentration that is 10 micromolar there is not much dip in the peak but after that at 20, 30, 40, 50 and 60 micromolar we have got significant peak and the change in the peak is no, in the peak values is not too much that means it is saturated and we can use this these values to calculate the KD value. Also in the data we can find out the uh, wavelength at which the peak is there. So if we see it is the we have got the peak at 396 nanometer as this is the these are the most negative values so now we are going to use this absorbance values at 396 nanometer to calculate the kd value so to calculate the kd value the formula is 1 divided by delta a is, is equals to kd divided by delta a alpha into 1 by s plus 1 divided by delta a alpha here delta a is the absorbance difference which we have got in the experiment and s is the 
concentration of the ligand so this equation this formula is a straight line equation like y equals to mx plus c c where y is is 1 by delta a and x is 1 by s so now from the data which we have got uh, we have taken this these are the ligand concentrations this is the delta a value at 396 nanometer and from this uh, we can calculate 1 by delta s and after that we can calculate 1 by delta a so now the, uh, we can plot a graph between uh, 1 by s and 1 by delta a 1 by s on x axis and 1 by delta a on y axis so here is the graph we can see we have got a straight line and the equation for this line is y equals to 164.4 x plus 29.671 so the intercept of this line is 29.671 which will be equal to 1 divided by delta a alpha here we can see 1 divided by delta alpha, alpha is 29.671 and the slope of this line is 164.4 which is will be equal to kd divided by delta a alpha so kd divided by delta alpha, delta a alpha is 164.4 so from from this 1 by delta a alpha value we can calculate the value of delta a alpha so delta a alpha is equals to 1 divided by this value which comes to be 0 0.0337 and now the kd value if we see the slope kd divided by delta a alpha is equals to 164.4 here we can put the value of delta a alpha which we have calculated and then find out the kd value so here the kd value comes to be 5.54 so the kd value for this ligand binding to this protein is 5.54 micromolar so this is how this is how we can use optical difference spectroscopy to calculate the kd value of a ligand binding to a protein it can also be used for other in interactions also but in this video we have taken a protein and a ligand interaction as examples thank you so this is all about the uh, potential of spectroscopy in measuring the uh, or mapping the enzyme substrate interactions so far what we have discussed we have discussed about the electroporotic techniques and how you can be able to use the electroporotic techniques to map the enzyme substrate interactions. The only condition is that the substrate should be proteinaceous in nature and it should give you a significant change in the molecular weight. And subsequent to that, we have also discussed about the spectroscopic techniques and we have discussed about the absorption spectroscopy as well as the different spectroscopy, how you can be able to use that for measuring the uh, substrate interaction studies. So in a subsequent lecture, we are going to discuss some more uh, techniques so that you can be able to use them for studying the substrate uh, and enzyme substrate interactions. So with this, I would like to conclude my lecture here. Thank you.